Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I am your host, Sherrard. Hope you're having a wonderful Wednesday evening. I know I'm very excited because we have two very charismatic uh, ladies, man looking gentlemen on the show tonight. Um, that is not Idris Elba on the show. That is Mr. Tyrone DeBose. And then here it is sitting there, Mr. Philip Ingram, the brother of the legendary James Ingram on today's special segment on the show entitled Never Forgetting Where You Came From. The Sherrard Show is brought to you by Essence Television. The Essence Television Network is the home of the Sherrard Show, where you can see the greatest interviews of your life. You can see the interviews with Smokey Robinson, the Isley Brothers. You can also see the Supremes and our special tribute ep episode to Mary Wilson, as well as this episode, ladies and gentlemen. You can see it on Essence Television. And if you miss it, you can also listen to it on iHeartRadio because the Sherrard Show is also on iHeartRadio. So don't miss it. Just add it on your special uh, smart device, or you can also just go to Roku and add the device there. Well, I was excited when I was told that there was going to be Mr. Tyrone DeBose on the show, as well as Philip Ingram. And I said we had to sit down and have a talk with these gentlemen because they can offer some wisdom and insight to young people as well as old alike on our special segment, again, entitled Never Forgetting Where You Came From. Uh, Tyrone DeBose, if you don't know him, he is a radio personality and celebrity. He's also the voice of Unsung, some of the greatest stories about music, such as David Ruffin, Martha and Vandella, so on and so forth. That's his voice. And he stopped by the Sherrard Show. And he's also talking about his book we're going to talk about tonight that he's written. I'm so excited to talk about it. Tyrone, welcome to the Sherrard Show. How are you? Thank you so much. Greetings and salutations. More importantly, I'm here with my brother, Phil, which is even better. <laughs> so that makes it even so cool. Phil, I love you dearly. You know that. And I'm I'm honored here to be on your show as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate I'm it. I'm so glad to have you. And Philip Ingram, he is the brother of the legendary James Ingram. He's also the founding member of Switch. He's also the voice of many, many commercials all the way down to Peter Pan, you name it as well. But he's also done major things in the industry. And I'm so humbled to have him on the show. Good evening, sir. Welcome, Philip, to the Sherrard Show. Thank you. Thank you for having. And again, like I said, I know Tyrone's going to be here, so it's going to be, we're just going to have some fun. And I'm so excited. It makes me happy as well. We will be taking your questions and comments later on in the show. And I'm going to throw it to you, Tyrone, first and foremost. Tyrone, tell us a little bit about how you got started in the industry. And was it full of bumps and bruises getting to where you are today? Well, you know, let me just begin by, first of all, thanking you and, and well as Philip. I'm, I'm honored to be here with you and, and as well as your your, your group. Um, I started actually by listening in Cincinnati, Ohio, to <clears throat> Casey Kasem's American Top 40. That's what, you know, got me started. Every week I would listen to Casey Kasem and I would listen to him talk about the charts and the history about the artists. And I said, as, you know, as I grew up one day, I wanted to be like Casey Kasem. And um, it... Uh, as time went on, you know, I got out here, did a public access show, and I would drive 144 miles every weekend to Barstow, California, to be on the air uh, from midnight to six from a full-time job. Then I'd be on the air from midnight to six because I wanted to be in radio to some degree. And, um, you know, like like Phil and all of us, you know, our struggles become our strength. And, you know, like everyone else, we sacrifice and do all we can to make our dreams come true. Now, this what year was this, Tyrone, that you were um, beginning your radio career? Um, I actually started in 2005. 2005. Oh, wow. I was wow. 45 years old. You know, some of the greatest um, radio hosts and personalities have come out of Ohio. I don't know what's with Ohio, but you brought out, uh, I know you know this name, Herb Kent. He actually started out. You know, oh, Herb Kent very well. I do as well. Yes. So that's yes. that's pretty amazing. We'll get back to you in a moment. Now, Philip, what about you? Now you came from a household full of singers, but your oldest brother James is the only one that pursued it. Tell us a little bit about how that was living in a household with all singers. So let me let me just correct you. It's actually six of us. James is number three. My oldest brother is Henry. Those mm -hmm. Henry boys, James, Janice, David, and me. But um, we all grew up. You know, we could all play instruments. We could all sing. But you're right, James and I are the only two that decided to do it for a living. But when James was 14, he got into his first band. And I was, um, we're six years apart. I was eight. I'm the youngest. And so he took me to rehearsals. And I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. But, you know, he's telling me, like, don't touch the drums. And I'm like, man, why you bring me? I'm like all excited. But when he was 20 years old, he came to California. And I was 14. And then, you know, when I was 18, that's when Switch got together. So actually Switch hit before James hit. And 
matter of fact, it's a quick conversation. When I called him, I said, hey, man, I'm coming to California. He, he said, for what? Because, <laughs> you know, I'm in Akron, Ohio. And uh, I said, we got a deal. And he was like, Negro, what do you mean you got a deal? <laughs> and I told him, basically, you know, Greg and them had come to California, ran into Jermaine, gave him the cassette. And he said, Philip, are you sure? So I said, James, yeah. So anyway, and that was, you know, the first album with They'll Never Be and Everything. But yeah, that was, a uh, I was 18 years old when that all happened. And, and that then, was with Motown, correct? Yeah, we got signed with Motown. We were on the Gordy label, right. Wow. Now, what year was this, uh, Philip, that this happened? We came to California and uh, it's funny, we got together in December 76. Greg and them came to California January 77, ran into Jermaine, and um, that's how that whole story went. And literally May of 77, which was kind of nuts, you know, we had only been together a couple of months. We had never really played together as a unit. Um, you know, Greg was in a band called White Heat. Me and Eddie Fluellen was in a band called Raw Soul. We used to do shows for him. So it was like a combination of these two bands that got together. Greg, Bobby, Tommy, and Jody were in White Heat, and they were splitting up. And, you know, I met Greg when I was 16 years old. And so that's how that all came about. So we got signed May of 77, and then They'll Never Be came out on July 78. Now, now I'm going to kick this to you. I want to I want to get that point that you just mentioned, Philip. But let me just kick something to you, Tyrone. You said something very interesting. You said in 2005 you were 45 years old, and that's when you started your musical journey. Now, did a lot of people come to you and say, "Oh man, you started too late. Are you too old to do this?" What was some of the uh, feedback you were getting starting at that age? Well, one of the biggest moments for me was um, this, there was a gentleman who came to me before I was in radio. And he asked me what I did. I said, well, I, I, I want to be radio, television. I want to do voiceovers. But he looked me in my face and said, but what do you do? And then I didn't answer him. And then he said, you don't know what you want. But the next time someone asks you that question, you better have an answer. And so for me, you know, the trek was I, they had this, um, this book where you were able to look at different uh, L.A. radio people. And they were, had these, these Southern California Broadcast Association. And they had people on there where they were asking you know, if you're interested in being in radio. And so this place in Barstow, California, which I'd never even heard of before, I drove out there, didn't even have air conditioning, and um, I took that job for the minimum wage in 2004. And um, I would be at a regular job, I had a full-time job with, you know, three different freeways from, you know, from where I live. And I'd be on the, on, in Barstow, California from uh, midnight to six on the air. And that's now how I started. Now, how far is Br Bristow? How far were you driving? Bristow is uh, halfway to Vegas. Oh, I wow. have 145 miles from my home. Oh, yep. wow. Well, that just shows you true passion to be able to do something that that just means nothing was going to stop you. Now, what about you, Philip? When you got the first deal with Motown, um, did the hit start cranking out right away? Actually, we have to say yes. It was, a, uh, um, like I said, Greg and them, they had already done an album on a RCA label with Barry White, he had changed the name. He used to be a band called TNT. Here's a short story. They were called TNT Flashers. Barry White picked them up, changed the name to White Heat, and they did a record on RCA Records. And then, you know, it didn't really happen, but, you know, um, it, Bobby sang some stuff, Greg and them, and they came back and they were in Akron, even though they were from Michigan. Some of them were from Ohio. And when we got together, I just knew that Greg and them already had a record deal. So, yeah, when we did our first um, showcase with it was Barry Gordy, Tony Jones, um, Suzanne DePass. And what's interesting, what a lot of people don't know, Bobby actually was not, um, when we got the band together, we had actually had a guy named Arnie Hayes, but because Bobby was you know, dealing with some drug issues. And then Arnie decided not to come, even though we had this deal pending. And so we knew Bobby would be a little volatile, but it's like, you know, had nothing to do with his talent. But he came and um, when we did our show showcase, we actually did, uh, you know, I want to be with you and some other stuff. And Barryden was just like, wow. I mean, and Suzanne DePass, that's actually how her name came about. She says, I've never seen so much switching in my life. Because basically, <laughs> be, let's say Bobby would be out there, I'd be on the keyboards. I'd go out and sing Bobby get on the keyboards. And Greg would be on the horns. And then when me and Bobby went out to sing, they'd get on the keyboards and everything was covered. You know, we just, that's what we did. And so when Suzanne DePass said that, but yeah, very numb, you could tell. And you got to realize, we walked in, you know, with Jermaine, and at the time, Jermaine was married to Hazel Gordy, which is Barry's daughter. I mean, now, now you're speaking of Jermaine Jackson, correct? Jermaine Jackson, I'm sorry, yeah. Now, now, when you speak of Bobby, who are you speaking of? Bobby who? Bobby DeBarge. Okay, Bobby. Now, okay, Bobby yeah. DeBarge and I, um, all of us sang, but Bobby DeBarge and I sang, uh, like, 
Tyrone trying to take, you know, I want to be closer. That was a duet between my, me and Bobby. That was um, second hit on our first album. But yeah, wow. so Bobby DeBarge. Now, now in 1977, what was Motown like there? Now, um, the Supremes were still together, but it wasn't the original members. And then right. there was a lot going on. Uh, Marvin Gaye was still there. There's a lot of other things going on. But what was Motown like back then? Actually, Motown had gone through that transition, you know, leaving Detroit, coming out to California. And a lot of the big names, um, you know, some were still there. Obviously, Stevie was still there. Um, matter of fact, he was doing that. Remember that girl? Told you? That was around that time. But um, the Commodores were coming into their own because that's when the Brick House album and Easy and we, you know, got to hang out with them. Diana Ross was still there. But it was us, um, Tina Marie, Rick James and a group called High Energy. And we were the ones that kind of got signed all around the same time. And so, uh, matter of fact, Rick and when they, when you and um, you and I came out, they'll never be came out. You know, same time. I still got stuff in our scrapbook from that getting promoted together with High Energy, um, Rick James, and uh, Switch. They were promoting all of us. Now, you know, it's one thing that's interesting, Tyrone, is that people, when they think of our disc jockeys, especially when I was growing up, doing mm -hmm. what you do, the biggest names was Dick Car Dick Clark and Casey Kasem. Dick Clark was around for eternity doing American Bandstand and even before then. And if you look at the footage on your screen, he had the Sam Cooks, he had the Jackie Wilsons, he had the Rod Stewart, he had all those people on there. Is that the steps you're trying to follow in or are you just um, doing your own trending? No, uh, my, my steps of, in radio and of being an R&B historian isn't based upon following in the footsteps per se. I, I like the fact that Casey Kasem knew the story and history about the artist and things of that nature. That's what I like. And he knew the countdown. So I knew the R&B charts and that was my key. I, I would buy the Billboard magazine every week when I was a teenager and I knew the charts and I knew the charts very well. Ironically, when Phil was talking over there when he was talking about high energy for example that song went to the top 10 on the pop charts uh you can't turn me off that was a great that was a big hit for them but they however became a one-hit wonder and then slowly but surely switch was making their way up the charts at the same time and uh you and i by rick james had hit later on in that in that year so right. i my goal was r&b history because i thought that that was going to be the legacy in which i needed to to preserve so as far as uh, being a host was concerned that wasn't my deal even being in radio wasn't my deal radio was the start of me becoming on television and becoming you know one of the the, the r&b historians here in the country you know you it's know, amazing I, i'll just say can i add that because mm -hmm. even though tyrone you know went through that route every single one of us have somebody that is kind of like a mentor to us in the business you know what i mean um even though we don't know him like you know, me growing up, people say, man, would you learn to sing? I said, from the school of Donny Hathaway and Stevie Wonder. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and you, you have, you have to have something to aspire to, and then you find your niche. So like him with Casey Kasem, same thing. Then he found his niche and the same thing with me. Matter of fact, uh, I love Stevie so much. I'm 18 years old. You know, you don't know who you are. And I, we were doing a record of Jermaine, St Jermaine Jackson stopped the tape and said, Philip, Stevie got his. <laughs> <laughs> I had to find Philip Ingram. And then, you know, you start trying stuff. And then when you start hearing people say, hey, man, Philip, is that you singing on? It's like, oh, and, you know, now 40 some years later, they know, but I'm just giving, but everybody has, you know, like his was Casey Case and mine was Stevie Wonder and, you know, Donnie Hathaway. <laughs> That's interesting you say that because um, when Marvin Gaye started, they had to teach him how not to, he wanted to be Sam Cooke. So they had to help him find his own voice. And Al Green and so many others, they wanted to mirror Sam Cooke. But when they found their own voice, what a voice it was. Is that correct, Philip? Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, like I said, everybody, we're influenced. Come on, you can't help it, right? But once you find your own, that's, uh, that's going to set you apart. You remember when American Idol first came out? Um, you know, Simon Cowell would say, I mean, you're like a cheap imitation of the original. You know what I'm saying? And you don't want to be that. And, you know, like when people say, you know, um, you know, it was, it was saying something. Well, what you want me to sing? It doesn't matter. What can you bring to the song? That's what matters. You know, I mean, you might sing Mary Had a Little Lamb better than anybody in life. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if you're like, I don't know what you want me to sing. No. OK, come on. That's amazing you say that because um, when I audition models and actors and singers, you know, if you're a singer, you better be able to sing. If you're an actor, you better be able to do a monologue. If you're a model, you better be able to walk. Don't yep. sit there and be like, well, I need a minute. Wait a minute. No, no. Next. Yeah, exactly. That's true. That's all it is. 
Now, now Tyrone, for you, you're doing something that's so interesting to me. Um, and I'll tell you why, because you give the history of R&B. People love to know, you know, when he wrote that song, what inspired him to write it? When did the song hit? And as we were talking about off air, what's is really neat is when you hear a certain song, and I asked this to the Isley Brothers, I asked this to Gene Chandler and everybody a couple of weeks ago, where were you when, what were you doing when you heard A Change Gonna Come? When that first came out, um, what were you doing? Uh, amazingly, you know, I know that that song was a part of the civil rights movement. I mean, it it was ironically the last song that made it to the top 10 for Sam Cooke after he passed away. That's when that song came out. Um, there were many, he didn't want to be a part of the civil rights movement. He just wanted to be a singer. Remember, Sam Cooke crossed over from gospel, called himself another name because he didn't want to, you know, that's his gospel route. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once it was found out he was Sam Cooke, then he embraced being a um, an R and B singer. And then he crossed over from the R and B charts to the pop charts, like with Chain Gang. That was one of his biggest songs on the uh, on the pop charts. Now, now, Tyrone, when you're doing uh, on song and you you get the the memo of who you're going to be covering, what particular artist really grabbed you the most when you're like, oh wow, I love to co cover this artist based upon the history? Well, let me tell you, um, one of the artists that I think always stuck out to me was Martha Wash. Martha Wash had three number one singles and never got credit for any of them. And part of the reason was because like Black Box, Everybody, Everybody, Strike It Up, and of course, Everybody Dance Now. She had three number one singles, but did not get the credit for it. And then when she realized that she didn't get the credit, she sued for it. And the reason why it was so obscure at that time was because it, it broke out at the same time of the Millie Vanilli scandal. And it was kind of kept on the back burner. And so, uh, so that was the one that always struck out to me that more than anything else had you know three opportunities to become a superstar and um and missed every one of them wow now did she ever recoup the uh royalties that she missed from having oh yeah they did in fact on the r&b charts it says that you know uh it always says that you know cnc factory did the group you know did the song however martha wash is the accredited singer of this this particular song not just with her with, with black box as well you know, other than known facts with her of course some of her biggest songs um was including I Who Had Nothing with Luther Vandross, but it never made the charts. As well as, uh, you know, a lot of R&B singers will always come to me and ask me a lot about the history of the charts, which is um, ironic. In fact, when we were speaking about Al Green earlier, for example, one of his biggest songs, Love and Happiness, only went to number 98 on the charts and only stayed there for three weeks. What? That song? Yeah. Holy cow. People are losing... People lose a lot of money betting against that one, but only 98 <laughs> on the charts. Holy yeah. cow. Now, what about yeah. you, Philip? Um, tell me this now, Motown, let me correct me if I'm wrong. If you had to put a ratio on the hits they were bringing out, would it be, uh, say, over 60% of the, of the groups that came in became hit makers? You mentioned a group I never heard. Was it called High Heat? No, High, High Energy. High Energy. High Energy. Now, I never heard of them. Did they have any hits? Yeah, like Tyrone said, it was You Can't Turn Me On. I think it was, that was the first one. Um, yeah, or you that was can't the biggest hit. Turn yeah. me, you can't turn me off in the middle of turning me on. That's right. And we they did about three albums, but that was like their biggest hit. Um, and one thing, I, honestly, that I learned about Motown from other um, record companies, especially at the time growing up, they they were about, you know, li literally think about it. They took people that had talent from the projects and made them household names. So when it came to developing artists, I mean, they knew how to do it. It's like, you know, when the Jackson 5 came out, you know, it's kind of like Follow the Beatles. You knew each individual in the band. That's what they did with the Jackson 5. But other bands, you just knew the band. You may know the lead singer, but you didn't know individuals. So that's what they were um, doing when Switch got signed. You know, they got to know Philip Ingram, Bobby DeBarge, Tommy DeBarge. They got to know individuals. <coughs> Motown was excellent with that. But then you think about it, like the Commodores, you think of the Commodores and you think about Lionel Richie. So, again... You know, there, he, there was a method to the madness. And yeah, they were d definitely some serious hit makers. But then you had ones like, um, uh, well, I can't think of her name right quick. Um, I love her, Tata Vega, who sings, wow. And she never had a big hit with Motown. But wow. but all the stuff in Color Purple, that's her, <laughs> you know. Wow, wow. But now, um, for you being around all of those talented people, when you first initially got to California, got signed, were you intimidated or you just hit the ground running? 
No, you know what? And you know, you talk about the theme of the show, never forget where you come from. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I definitely thank my parents because, you know, a lot of times when I'm working with singers, I said, you know, there's, there's a thin line between being cocky and confident. When you're cocky, you ain't gonna have a lot of people who wanna work with you. But if you're confident, you know, just like you said, that, that artists come up, that's a totally different thing. So when we were growing up, we were taught that we couldn't say can't, you know, we said, oh, dad, I can't. And my father said, come here. And we think we're in trouble. You know, we got used to it. And he, seriously, he go, we little, he said, let me feel your muscle. And then he'd always say, you and Ingram, you can do it. So we knew we can do it. And honestly, we were excited about Motown. And when we, uh, when we did that showcase, we're like, we just going to do what we do. If they don't take us, there's other record companies. I mean, that was our mentality, but obviously we wanted to be part of Motown. Mm -hmm. So we didn't get like, because again, the, uh, if you're not relaxed in, this, in whatever setting you do, you know, just like you, I can tell you relax the way you talk to people and ask questions. If you're not that, it's not going to come across. So you have to be yourself relaxed. So I used to tell singers, you know, um, I don't care if you in a little bar that got two, three people or you sing in front of 100,000 people. If you ain't relaxed because you folks, then you ain't going to do your best. That's so, correct. That's yeah. absolutely correct. So, so now um, for you, and, I, and this is for you as well, Tyrone, but I'll give it to you first, Philip. So a lot of people say, you know what, I'll never change. You know, I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. You know, I remember where I came from and blah, blah, blah. And then they get their first check. Now, how were you when you first got your first check? Was it that you have to go back on what you were thinking and say, you know what, I got to never forget where I came from. Or you had somebody had to check you down the road. What's well, funny, I did a show with a member, Patrice Chocolate Banks from, you know, Bram Central Station. She had a show and she had me on the show. And I said, I said, Patrice, because her and I used to do sessions and stuff together. I said, let me tell you something. When I would go home, my parents were very proud. Yeah, we got platinum album stuff. It was like, Philip, take out the trash. Philip, <laughs> shovel the snow. I mean, they didn't care. I mean, yeah, they were proud, but no, no, no. We, so they never let, let us, you know, they, they were proud of us, but it wasn't like, you know, you come home, I'm Henry Ingram's son, you know, I'm Alistair Ingram's son. So, <laughs> but they're proud of me. So no, yeah. they, they never let us forget that. And um, which I'm, I'm happy about. So no, I never, people that know me literally from grade school, they say, man, you stayed the same, which is a compliment. Wow. That, that's a compliment and an accomplishment. What about you, Tyrone, when you got that massive check and the bank had to get, when you went to go deposit it or got direct deposit and the bank looked at you and said, wait a minute, man, you know, what do you want to do with this? Now, all of a sudden you miss the boys once they see that check that was an account. <laughs> How were you able to respond or were you able to check yourself and be humble right away or somebody had to check you? You know, humility is a big deal to me. You know, I, I certainly know where I can, and Phil speaks, it's so real. I, I hear Philip talking and it's almost the same, but of course we're from Ohio and we got Midwestern roots. It's a bit different for us, yeah. but I can tell you that um, I'd never really had a lot of anything in my life. So for me, I, I wasn't the guy who needed the fancy cars or a nice home and all of those things. It took me a, a, a little while to know that it was okay to, to have a, a decent television or, or a nice computer or, you know, all of those things, Keep in mind, you know, I'm 60 years old now. I mean, it didn't all come, you know, sunshine and rainbows for me. You know, I had a full-time job at the same time I was doing these things and working for not just, you know, my brother, AJ Jamal, who's a comedian. And, um, but after I left him, I started working for uh, Kim Whitley, who was one of the toughest people I've worked for as her road manager, but it got me prepared for what I was today. And so now working with Cheryl Underwood on her show being the number one R&B, you know, urban show in, in, the, in America. I mean, all of that came based on me just staying humble and kind and remembering that, you know, I, there didn't have to be something better about me. I just needed to be different and remember where I came from. This could all be gone in a day and it doesn't mean anything uh, for me. Yeah, same day it could be gone. Yes, sir, Phil. Just one thing, because what Tyrone is saying is so, and I think if you, if you want to summarize it, um, you better have a definition of yourself before anything happens. Because if you let something define who you are, then you will, you will not be yourself. And, yeah. you know, perfect example. I, you know, I love playing basketball. So when, you know, switch was hitting, I used to play at Balboa Park, you know, we had a hit, I'm still playing at Balboa Park. And they'd be like, oh man, it's Philip Ingram switch. I'm like, um, actually I'm Philip Ingram, switch is the band that I'm with. Whatever happens to switch, I'm still Philip Ingram. <laughs> I would always say that because Switch didn't define Philip Ingram. 
you know what I mean? Filipino was already defined. And because of that, that's how I was able to be a part of Switch. So yeah. I just I just wanted to add that. Make sure that you have your definition. You know who you are. Regardless yeah. Of that money, cause that's yeah, I was going to. Yeah, I'm going to add something to that, Phil. You know, it's interesting you say that. Shortly after, you know, I had cancer. And then after I got cancer, I remember watching a, a commercial on television where it was for Party City and it was telling people, you know, about graduating and wishing all the, you know, graduates a day of smiles. What many people didn't know is that I didn't finish high school and I quit in the ninth grade. So I went back to school recently and went all four years to get my high school diploma. Wow. And so what happened is that people recognized who I was and want to take pictures and everything. And I remember in the third year, one of the ladies there, their, their teacher said, you know, why don't you just take the GED? She said, because everyone knows who you are here. You're a public figure, you're a celebrity. Why don't you just take the GED? And I remember saying to her, ma'am, that's been the story of my life, taking shortcuts. It's the very reason why I need to be able to know that I finished something in life. And mm -hmm. I went back and just graduated a couple of years ago from, uh, from high school with Donald Beach. And, I, and I, it wasn't that it was needed, but it was needed to fulfill a part of me. And so it's been my, you know, the apex of who I am whenever I've done something. You know, I've had many struggles in my life of trying to figure out who I was. And, you know, you know the whole time I thought that these struggles were holding me back, they were really just giving me the tools to become one of the best. You know, yeah. one thing I find out is so fascinating about people like yourselves, uh, you, Philip, as you as well, Tyrone, people who've made it and accomplished it. You all are typically so humble and so gracious as if you never made it. But then you have people who never made it, or want to be famous, et cetera. <laughs> Many times those are the hardest people to deal with because all you want to do is have them on a Sherrard show. Now I got to go to their manager, go through their booking agent, go through the parking lot attendant, et cetera, just to have them on the show. And nobody knows who you are except for a few people on Instagram. Have you ever experienced that? Definitely. I mean, I mean, not, not me personally, but yeah, I definitely know a lot of people like that. And it's like, again, see, um, just like Tyrone, you know, you said 45, you're 60 now, that's 15 years. Longevity in this business, you know what I mean? You, um, you, yeah, you know, it's, you, I mean, I mean I'm giving an example. I, I, you know, when I started doing a bunch of uh, sessions, like I said, as a session singer, um, 25 years later, there's this company called abcmouse.com and it's a, it's a children's thing. And they were doing some singing and Stephanie, she's, you know, you never know, you know, she left that and she was a vice president of this company and they were doing some stuff. And she happened to say um, to some singers, she says, she, does anybody know how to get a hold of Philip Ingram? A guy named Randy Crenshaw, he said, oh, yeah, we work together quite a bit. She said, I'd love to get, I enjoy working 25 years later. You see what I'm saying? So if I had been that cocky, you know, man, you know what I'm saying? You know, it, it, it's like, they don't care about the talent. Stuff changes, you know, here we are. So, and I ended up doing a whole bunch of stuff for abcmiles.com. It's not a residual thing. It's an educational thing, but it's in schools and everything. So that's what I'm saying. It's, I've had a lot of longevity because people have enjoyed you see, when we came on, me and Tyrone mess with each other. <laughs> that's who we've always been. So it's wonderful. It's so wonderful. But that's what makes the difference. Amen. Amen. And, yeah. and I love that about you two gentlemen. Um, it makes it so wonderful. But it's a big example to the young crowd as well, because a lot of times, you know, when I was a kid, even when I was in my teenage years, I used to see these music videos and, you know, these rappers on here. And you think they made it big because you see the mansions in the background of Ferraris and all that stuff. But little do you know, that was just their advance money that they're promoting, they really broke. And then, you know, after a while, you know, they don't have another hit. You don't see them anymore, but they were fronting as if they were this big time millionaire and all this other stuff. That's ugly. And it takes a lot of energy to keep up that charade. Don't you think Tyrone? Yeah, you know, I was gonna say something. Part of the people that I've been around that have helped me a great deal was people just like Philip and Greg and, and the members of Switch and, and not only them, but one of my best friends is Ernest Thomas of, you know, what's happening. He's one of my best friends. Oh, wow. And I got an, I got a great opportunity to learn how to become humble and kind every time I'm with people who are of that nature. And that's, that's really, really, really important to me. I remember when I was just trying to struggle just to try to figure out where I was at and I was really down and out. And I remember watching an Oprah Winfrey show where John Travolta was on there and he was talking about himself and, and the things in which he was doing about his life. At the end of that show, I recall Oprah Winfrey saying to him, John, thanks so much for coming on. 
She said, you have the rare quality of being able to make people feel good about themselves when they're with you. And he started crying. And I remember, I remember I was feeling really low at that part and at that point in my life. And I said, you know, I, I can do that. Even, you know, I, it didn't require much. I can make people feel good about themselves. So for me, that's very important when I meet people. So when I'm on the red carpet, so when I'm out somewhere, it's very important. The first time that people meet me, I need it to be the best time, yeah. even when I'm not at my best. Amen. I, I and love Phil that. Understands that. And Phil understands that more. I know he understands that more. Than oh, yeah. Anybody, he gets I love it. that. Yeah. But you know, the thing is that my thing here at the Sherrod Show was I love giving you your flowers while you're still living. A lot of times, you know, you see that little blurb of somebody passed away and everybody want to say rest in peace and all that. Contrary to what you may know, they can't hear you. But why don't you give them their flowers while they're still living? Because I don't know about you, but Philip, your music has changed my life. Hearing you on the radio, Tyrone, what you have brought to the table and educated me on, you know, I had to have you on the show just to tell you to your face. Thank you. <laughs> the, the honor is absolutely mine. And just uh, something that Phil said that I just want to remind your, your guests that they understand, you know, it takes six people when you said that about roses and, you know, flowers when they're alive, it takes six people to put you in the ground. Wouldn't it be great if you had those six people lifting you up? Oh my goodness, man. I, oh. I wasn't, I wasn't planning on passing a collection plate on this episode, <laughs> but you're about to make me pass it now. But that's a quote I'm going to steal. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Hey, Tyrone, good, I'm going to give you credit the first time. No, I'm just... I appreciate that. I like, I like that. Well, Not ladies right, and gentlemen. Tyrone Dubois, all rights reserved. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking to two very iconic individuals, radio personality and host uh, Tyrone DeBose, as well as the iconic Philip Ingram, the brother of the legendary James Ingram. Now we're taking your questions, ladies and gentlemen, but before we take your questions, I do want to uh, talk about Tyrone, your book that is coming out soon. Tell us a little bit about your book. Well, you know, during this pandemic part, I remember someone saying to me, Tyrone, you're great on television. You know, you're, you're on one of the best shows on TV. You're doing great on Cheryl Underwood's show. He said, you're legitimized, but a book would solidify you. And I think that that was one of the things that I really needed to learn. So I made this book and it's called The Four Seasons of R&B. And it's based on my top 10 list of groups from the 50s, I mean, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, because in essence, that was really the four seasons of R&B. It was really the 60s through the 90s. And, you know, before then, it was the 50s where it started. And to some degree, the 90s is almost practically where it ended. So I got my top 10 list, my personal top 10 list of all of those people. And I learned a lot about groups, for example, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of groups, a lot of stuff. Of, and that just really surprised me. What's interesting, you know, for example, in the 80s, you know, uh, I mean, in the 70s, Aretha Franklin was the queen of soul. In the 80s, Aretha Franklin was the queen of soul again, but not by much. And that's what's interesting. People don't know that. And the biggest artist that was right behind Aretha Franklin in the 80s wasn't Anita Baker or Patti LaBelle or even Whitney Houston. It was Stephanie Mills. Oh, 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 you're dropping bombshells on us, yeah. Tyrone. We so know that's that. what's interesting about the book. It learned I learned a lot. I learned a lot about when, you know, he was with Motown and you know, the Jackson Five had 28 singles that entered the charts, and 25 of those 28 reached the top 10. Wow, wow, Damn. that is something. Boy, you're dropping some knowledge on us, and now the questions are lighting up. Um, well, this is this question is for um, this is for you, Philip. We're going to start this question off now. This is Antonio. Antonio, he is from Baltimore, Maryland. He said, "Philip, I'm a mega fan of Switch as well as of yours and all the things you've done in the industry. Thank you for your contribution." His question to you is: Of all the artists you've been around, which particular artists um, have blown your mind? Uh, I actually have to say, um, probably. Quincy Jones, when I first, uh, when James started working with Quincy, you know, um, when he did that whole Just Once thing, um, I hadn't met Quincy yet, but when um, Ernie Watts, saxophone player, it was me, James, and Phil Perry, we did some backgrounds. It was the first time I met Quincy, I was like, man, here's somebody that's done, I mean, a plethora, talking about decades, and was still, you know, kept reinventing himself, you know, at the time when we were working with him, you know, he was doing the Thriller album, which is still the biggest selling album. But he always stayed Quincy. I mean, um, I got to do that 1982 tour with him, um, the Dude Tour. And, you know, I've done a lot of work with him off and on over the years. And he's just, and I said, 
because I was in my early 20s then, you know, and the last thing I did with him, we did that 60 years of Quincy Jones at the Hollywood Bowl in 2011. And the, the respect and it was packed, it just didn't matter what all the hits. Again, did that stuff define him? Well, well, what? I mean, he was a producer. He was a writer. He was a trumpet player. He was a, you know, TV themes. He was, you know, um, conductor for Frank Sinatra. You know what I mean? He was still Quincy Jones. And I just remembered he impressed me with everything that he had as one of probably probably one of the favorite people I've ever worked with. Wow, wow, appreciate your question. And this is for you, uh, Tyrone, this is from Sean. This is from Sean, he's actually from Cincinnati. His question <laughs> to you, Tyrone, is you mentioned, you mentioned that you did not graduate um, high school, you dropped out in ninth grade, um, but when people tell you that you can't be a radio personality without a degree, how were you able to become one without a high school diploma? Very good question. <laughs> Very good question, Sean. First of all, and um, long live the great Cincinnati Bengals, even though they're in last place. I want to make that sure. <laughs> but Bill's from Ohio, too. He's going to claim Cleveland, but he's from Ohio. Okay. Um, Sean, let me just say, um, one of the things that mattered to me was that I had nothing to lose. I had nothing else left in me. And one of the things that I've learned, particularly for everything in life, we have 1,440 minutes in a day. And my job was to try to figure out if I had this dream, I had to spend a minimum of at least 60 minutes a day on my dream, some kind of way. And I was ready to learn. And that was the key. When I got the job in Barstow, the guy said, you're going to get the worst pay and the worst, you know, um, you, the worst hours. You start at midnight, you know, you drive 144 miles and I got the minimum wage, but I, I wanted to be in radio so bad. It was, it was all I had. And when you have a dream, it really doesn't matter what anybody says or thinks you're just going to do what it takes. And that's what I did. I mean, Phil understands this as well. I mean, when, when all we have are dreams, that's, that's all I had. So the going back to high school wasn't, um, wasn't because I had to, it was because I needed to know that I could finish something in my life because I never really finished anything. And so I had to feel like I, I did something, Sean. So, you know, it's not about how, you know, like I, Rocky says, and, uh, you know, it's not about how you, hard you hit, it's about how hard you get hit and keep moving forward. If you know what you're worth, you go out and get what you're worth. You just gotta be willing to take the hits. Very good, I mean, very good. I, yeah, I, yes, I, sir. I add this one title, book title to uh, Sean's um, question. A guy by the name of Gary Cox wrote a book, Don't Let Others Rent Space in Your Head. Your Head. So if you think about that, what they're saying that what you can and cannot do, they're not you. You define, again, what you can or cannot do. If not, if you're going to let other people define, you're letting other people rent space in your head. You've already mercy. lost. You've mercy, already lost. Mercy. Aren't those the same ones when they, who tell you you can't do it but when you make it? They'd be like, man, I knew you could do it. <laughs> Of course. Those are the same ones. Let's sit it, down with it, you. Okay. it reminds me of a Hollywood shuffle, Winky Dinky Dog. That's what it reminds me You're of. Right. <laughs> I knew he was going to make it. Didn't I tell you he was going to make it? Was like, oh. <laughs> all right, now this last question. Now, we can't take all your questions, but this last question is Tiffany. She's from Portland. Now, this is from both of you all. I'll start off with you, Philip. Her question, she's at, first of all, she's saying she's a fan. Congratulations. It's wonderful to see Black men doing iconic things. Her question is, what kind of racism did you have to deal with and how were you able to overcome it um, due to your success in the industry? Philip, I'll start with you. Actually, um, we, uh, we grew up without, without uh, any prejudice, you know, I, even uh, in, in high school and junior high, I mean, had, you know, white, black friends that we still in touch with today. And um, again, thanks to my parents, we just saw people, you know, had nothing to do with the color. So um, even coming into this industry, it was like, and here's what the thing you got to realize. Um, and this is Philip Ingram's, I don't let other people's issues become mine. So that's their <laughs> issue. Prejudice is their issue. It's not Philip Ingram. So that's how I was able to. So if somebody, you would call me a black so-and-so, that's your issue. <laughs> Amen. Amen. A apparently, they're uh, they're they're uh, you're written. They're taking space up in your you're taking space up in their head. Apparently, <laughs> that's the truth. That they feel that bad about you, boy. I, I see you. I see you gonna start using some of these quotes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm gonna have to start, man. Because uh, let me let me write that down too. <laughs> what about you, Tyro? Um, you know, ironically, I recall when I got the job in Barstow, unknowing to me at that point, up until that time, there had never been uh, a black radio announcer. 
<laughs> and I remember that the guy told me who was training me, he said, look, I'm just going to tell you this right up front. We've never had a black radio announcer here. And then he said like this. And I said, what does that mean? He said, that means that you could last six days, six months, six years, who knows? But I was determined to, I just, it really didn't matter. To be fair, he, he wasn't saying it in a bad way. He was rooting for me to to be something different. But I've always learned, you know, something that Phil said that, and I hope that your audience takes as well. Never learn to be relevant, learn to reinvent. When you reinvent yourself, that's what people look for in you and in your life. That's what you should always do. You know, and by the way, the access to my energy from this point forward and for the rest of my life, it's a privilege. Amen. That's so wonderful to hear that. Well, um, Philip, now tell me, where can your fans keep up with you uh, for all the things you have upcoming, uh, buy your music, et cetera? Actually, the, um, I have a Reverb Nation page, like ReverbNation.com forward slash Philip Ingram. And you, know, you can become a fan. That's I use their, uh, their fan base because I love what they have. And when I'm doing, I mean, right now, you know, nobody's doing shows, but I would send that out and it would go to, you know, literally everybody. Cause people say, man, let me know when, when you go. I'm like, uh, it'd be, cause see, I, I do the stuff with Switch, but also I've been working with Sheena Eason for 15 years as well. So, and I've done my own shows. So I would say, you know, this is happening and I'd send it out and there's, like, oh man, I'm, I live, you know, 20 minutes from there. It's like, cool. So that's, that's, and um, they can go there, but also, uh, you know, I have a Facebook page as well that they can usually whatever I do on Reverb Nation, it links to the Facebook and it shows out on there as well. We appreciate this right on your monitor, ladies and gentlemen, so you can be able to reach out to this gentleman and a scholar. I want to thank him so much for being on the Sherrard Show this evening. What about you, Tyrone? Where can your fans keep up with you? Oh, well, it's kind of cool. I, I finally figured this out. Um, I have a uh, page. Uh, my, my website is called rnbhistorian.com. I'm also on uh, Facebook. You can, you can Google a brother. It's kind of cool. Like I saw, I saw I have a Wikipedia page. It's kind of cool. It's like, you know, yeah. that you feel kind of good. Like, <laughs> whoever did that, thank you. That was kind of good. Yeah, it was um, nice. But that you was can nice. reach me at rnbhistorian.com. I'm also on Facebook and uh, LinkedIn and some of the other places as well. Um, and uh, I, I, to those people who are here tonight, I can't thank you enough for all of your kindness. And I, I know I, I speak for Phil as well. We wouldn't be where we were without exactly. kind people as yourself. And that, exactly. that means a lot, not just to me, but to Phil and to all of us who um, have placed humility in God first. And that's- We, re we really appreciate you all. Appreciate you all so much uh, coming on the Sherrard Show. It's so exciting to have you on. I hope you audience members have learned something. Learn to never forget where you came from. These men are very, very humble, very thankful and very successful in what they've done as well. And ladies and gentlemen, when we on our next episode of the Sherrard Show, we got Mr. David Allen Gria stopping by as well as Mr. Tommy Davidson gonna be on the Sherrard <laughs> Show. You don't wanna miss it. And also follow us on our Instagram as well, on your monitor, as well as our new newsletter as well. Thank you gentlemen so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We will see you on next episode. Bye-bye now. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Sherrod Show. If you like additional information about our episodes, you can log on to thesharadshow.com. You can also check us out on social media, like us on Facebook, look at our YouTube video, subscribe to our newsletter at essencetelevisionnetworks at gmail.com. If you would like to get information to the host, Sherrod, you can email him at thesharadshow.com. Once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.